website, you likely know that Tuesday night we reached a tentative agreement with the board. Uh, this Monday, the bargaining committee and the executive committee will be meeting to review and discuss the final document, and at that time, we'll discuss the best method for sharing the details of the agreement with you prior to our ratification meeting. We'll also discuss and plan our timeline for ratification. As soon as these decisions have been made, we'll communicate them with you, all of you. This year has been especially challenging for bargaining. It was made even more challenging if, as we have had a large amount of turnover on the district's bargaining team due to changes in administration. As you will hear from the bargaining committee moving forward, we're confident that amidst the challenges, we are bringing to you an agreement that we strongly support and will be encouraging you to strongly support. Please continue to stay involved and engaged as we work towards ratification and get a new agreement in place at the start of the school year. Now, having referenced the video updates, I would like to acknowledge what some of you may already know. Formal public speaking has never been one of my true gifts. <laughs> For those of you that have been watching the bargaining updates, either on the UFIA website, ufia.org, or the UFIA Facebook page, that won't surprise you. I have a tendency to make unusual facial expressions <laughs> or affect a strange pitch and timbre in my speech. It's really quite different from my usual laid-back spoken manner. And so I've been working a little bit on this over the summer. Again, if you want to see the progress, go ahead and check out the UVA page. <laughs> you might even like the Facebook page on your smartphone sometime today, if you've got a minute. Now, this moment right here, I've been eager for and anticipating for quite some time. Yet, because of my self-awareness, I have to admit that this moment also felt as though it were approaching with an impending sense of doom. <laughs> I know that this moment right now may be the one moment all year when we are all in the same room united and I will be able to speak to you. However, mixed with my fear of messing up such an important moment, is an underlying and overwhelming sense of pride. That pride comes from being part of one part of this great organization full of great people. I'm a proud member of the National Education Association, a proud member of the Illinois Education Association, and a proud member of the Unit 5 Education Association. I couldn't be more proud to be one of you and to have the privilege of representing you and advocating for you. Earlier this spring, and again this summer, I had the opportunity to listen to outgoing NEA President Dennis Van Roepel. Seriously, you should see some of his speeches. He's almost as eloquent as I. <laughs> he encouraged all educators to define, lead, and own this profession. And I'll let you in on a little secret. Here in the Unit 5 Education Association, we do define and lead this profession. Here's how I know. This is the first school year all teachers are being evaluated using the new evaluation system. The system of evaluation is based on enhancing professional practice, a framework for teaching referenced earlier today. It's a delightful <laughs> text written by Charlotte Danielson. As many of you are aware, <laughs> this system involves forms, meetings, and countless hours of self-reflection. But you know, that's the stuff we already do, so no big deal, right? <laughs> Speaking of forms, some of you may be familiar with Form A. You may have spent a little time filling in domains one and four, agonizing about how to best present yourself, providing evidence, maybe even tossing in a few artifacts that you're especially proud of and feel demonstrate your excellence. You have undoubtedly spent a meeting or two reflecting on that evidence that your evaluator recorded 
and provide it to you, you are probably explaining why something she or he observed demonstrated you were excellent. Reflecting, explaining, <laughs> clarifying, and all the while growing to enhance your professional practice to better serve the students of the Unit 5 School District. Part of this time and effort may be due to personal pride, but part of this pressure may also be due to a quote from that book. Many of you are familiar with them. And I can't tell you the number of times that I have sat in meeting and heard the words of this book misquoted. I'd like to briefly read a fragment from Charlotte's book. Excellence level performance is a good place to visit, but don't expect to live there. Have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to read... <laughs> I'd like to read you the entire sentence. Charlotte writes, and I quote, As some educators have phrased it, excellence level performance is a good place to visit, but don't expect to live there. End quote. Do you hear that subtle difference? Some educators have phrased it. Charlotte didn't say using her framework, which, by the way, was intended as a tool to encourage reflection and growth, and never intended to be used as an evaluation tool. Charlotte did not say that using this would lead to more proficient teachers and less excellent ones. She did not say we cannot live in excellence. She said some educators said not to expect to live in excellence. And let me tell you, those educators are not UPIA educators, and they clearly are not familiar with us. We define this profession because our practice is excellent. Excellence defines us as UFIA educators, and excellence is in fact not a place that we visit. Nope, excellence is where we live. <laughs> I have to acknowledge that as UFIA educators, we at times travel between excellent and proficient. But we moved into Excellent, and we built some subdivisions there. <laughs> excellence. excellence is how we define our work and our profession. We may still have homes and satisfactory, and we work together in unity to improve our practice because we are leaders. Leaders of students, leaders of teachers, and leaders in our community. Now, before you question the veracity of my above statement, I'd like to share some data with you. <laughs> In the 2010-2011 school year, 100% of teachers were rated satisfactory or excellent. And again, in 2011 and 2012, the first year of partial implementation, and if you recall, the implementation was non-tenured teachers as well as select volunteers <coughs> to be in the, Dar Dar the Danielson framework. We had, again, 100% of teachers rated excellent or satisfactory. Now, I have to tell you, in 2012 and 2013, we did dip to 99%. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the data from last year from the unit office, but I highly doubt that those numbers have changed drastically. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the teachers of Unit 5 Education Association are excellent. We define this profession and we lead this profession. But now I have to tell you, there's one thing that I haven't talked about yet. Dennis reminds us that we must define, lead, and own the profession, and so now it's our time to own it. I'm certain that in your spare time this summer, you may have seen some political commercials, perhaps you read an editorial, maybe you even attended a rally, or perhaps watched a video on Facebook. I'm certain that you're aware that in our state, and we're in the midst of a tumultuous and uncertain search for a governor. Now, let me restate that. As owners, 
we have a governor, but we're also experiencing some buyer's remorse. <laughs> we have not been underfunding of our public schools with the pension rating or the general lack of respect that we are currently afforded as educators and leaders. While we cannot lay all of this burden on our current leadership in Springfield or even Washington, D.C., they are certainly part of the problem. That being said, we cannot afford to sit back and take and not take ownership of our government. If we're going to own this profession, we have to speak up. We have a choice. We can sit back and take what is given to us, or we can stand up for ourselves and our students and speak up for what we value. And we shouldn't kid ourselves. The consequences of quietly going about our work and not standing up or speaking out won't be positive. If we choose to keep our voices silent when it comes to the very decisions that impact our profession, we could soon find our collective voice silenced as well. That's right, we could find ourselves in the same situation so many of our brothers and sisters around us have, facing the loss of our right to collectively bargain. Through collective bargaining, we define our employment so that we can more effectively lead our students. Through collective bargaining, we define the salary schedule that not only is our livelihood, but so often is what provides us with the income to buy supplies that are missing from our classrooms. <laughs> classroom libraries with books and to create an environment that is both inviting and student-centered. We have worked too hard to lose this fight. This November, we must own our profession, own our involvement in this election, and own our voice in our government because we know that we have to vote or die. <laughs> I just did that. I quoted P. Diddy. <laughs> in 2006, P. Diddy's vote or die campaign helped to awaken a new voice in American politics. Now it's time for us to raise our voices, define, lead, and own. In November, we must vote or die. And I'm not trying, I am not trying to influence your vote through a political speech, but if you want to talk afterwards, I'll give you some facts. <laughs> but rather, I would like to encourage you to exercise your right as a citizen, to vote in your own self-interest, to speak up and define this profession, to stand up and lead this profession, and to take control and own this profession by going to your polling station and casting your vote for public education. The last gubernatorial election was won by an average of three. Yes, three votes per polling station. So your vote for public education counts. This year, too much is at stake for our system of free public education to sit back and not take ownership. We define, we lead, and now we must own. Vote or die. <laughs> now, before I relinquish this podium, which for the last two years as vice president I have worried about, and for the last three months of summer as president I have agonized about, I would be remiss to step down without thanking a number of individuals. I'd like to thank the board and the administration for sharing this exciting day with us through a clause in our negotiated contract. Thank you. <laughs> people would stand and remain standing for just a moment, I'd like to recognize a few of you. Vice President Lindsay Dickinson, <laughs> Treasurer Extraordinary Dean Brown, and Secretary Without Compare Tracy Freeman. Now, additionally, in the House, additionally in the House, we have some bargaining committee members who spent countless hours this spring and throughout the summer negotiating the contract. Not here today are Monique Call and Donna Matlock, but we've got Kathleen Berberick. Dan Swallow and Judy Hagler, as well as Tyler McWhorter. Actually, we stand on the shoulders of the people.
people who have negotiated contracts before. So if you've negotiated a contract, could you please stand up if you've ever negotiated a contract for Unify? <laughs> served on the executive committee, please stand up. If you have building reps in here, if you have building rep, please stand up. Or if you have been a building rep, please stand up. Now, anyone who's ready to define and lead this profession, please stand up. If you're ready to own this profession, please stand up. out together. Thank you for the awesome privilege of being your voice, your representative, and your advocate. Thank you for defining excellence in the work that you do, for leading with excellence each and every day, and for sticking together as we stand up, speak up, and own our profession. This is a great place to work and a great place to learn because each and every one of you does great work. Thank you. Thank you. 